Suspense. And the producer of CBS Radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. Twenty-nine and a half hours ago, off San Pedro Light, 41 sleek ocean-going yachts crossed the starting line on the 21st Trans-Pacific Honolulu race. Tonight, this great blue water sports event is the scene of our story of suspense. Written by Sam Pierce, a man who should know his subject, for he is not only the official news correspondent of the race, but a member of the crew of the schooner Queen Mab. To all the contenders of the Trans-Pacific, our best wishes for good luck and good sailing, and our fervent hope that nothing happens to them as frightful as Mr. Pierce has imagined in his story. And now, Blood is Thicker, starring Mr. Everett Sloan. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. It's a simple enough plan, as plans go. There's a girl, Vanessa Evans. She's young, very pretty, built like you dream, and you dream some John T. dreams. And most important, she's loaded with money. Left to her by her papa, who also left her oil wells, cattle ranches, and a 70-foot ocean racing schooner, which Vanessa sails with magnificent skill. The plan? Why, to marry Vanessa and her money and her yacht. You've sailed with her every weekend for the last two months, and now she's invited you to crew on the Honolulu race. And although your yachting experience has been limited to a few weekends on friends' boats, you've always been able to talk a good game... And with as willing a listener as Vanessa, who could steer a wrong course, as they say in yachting circles. So now it's the day of the start. And as you swing jauntily aboard the sleek 70-footer, your spirits are soaring. You feel every inch the gentleman sailor your carefully selected wardrobe makes you look. Uh, Welcome aboard, Mr. Farley. Thank you, Captain. Morning, Mike. Vanessa, boy, don't you look wonderful. Thank you, sir, she said. (laughs) Hi, Skipper. Mike. We can take off any time now. Doc's aboard. We all here, Vanessa? Crew complete? We're all here, Mike. But there's been a little change in personnel. Charlie Edmonds had his appendix taken out night before last night. No kidding. So I've asked my cousin, Hugh Guthrie, to sail with us in his place. I'd like you to meet him. Hugh! This is Mike Farley, my cousin Hugh Guthrie. Oh, very glad to know you, Mike. Thank you. Vanessa was telling me you've done quite a bit of sailing on the East Coast. I thought perhaps we might... I, uh, I made the Bermuda races a couple of times. Ah, fine race. What boat? Uh, the, uh, Quintana. Quintana! Mike raced on her in 1952, the year she won. Yes. Uh, you done much sailing, Hugh? I used to sail a good deal with Vanessa's father. He was one of my smarter type cousins. He handled all of Dad's business affairs. He handles them for me now. Oh, I see. You uh, from out here? Oh, no, no. I tend store back in New York. You flew all the way out just to make the race with us. I was glad to find an excuse to get away for a while. And who could ask for anything nicer than sailing with a first-class skipper like Vanessa again? Particularly on a boat like the Segway. You've uh, sailed on the Segway before? Sailed on. <laughs> oh. He knows her like a book. Oh, well, that's a relief to me. Charlie and I were teamed up as watch partners. We were to work the foredeck and the pulpit, and that's no place for a green one. Well, you may have to bring me up to date on a few things up there, but I think I'll remember most of the rig. Oh, I'm sure you will. Uh, excuse me, Miss Evans, but the crew are all present. All the gear is stowed. I wondered if you'd like to be getting underway pretty soon. Thank you, Pete. I think we can go any time now. Yeah, fine. Stand by to let go of the lines. Mac, you take the spring line. All right. Mr. Farley, you're stationed forward. You can let go of the starboard bow line. Okay, Pete. And Mr. Guthrie, you're uh-huh. forward with Mr. Farley. Uh... You watch Vanessa as she backs the Segway out of the slip into the channel. And you can't help wishing that Charlie Edmonds was your watchmate instead of Vanessa's kissing cousin, Hugh Guthrie. <laughs> breakwater now, beating slowly to windward. The breeze is fresh, even in the lee of Point Furman, and your uneasiness about your plan and the complications Vanessa's cousin Hugh might present fade out in the anticipation of the most exciting of all moments, the start. Forty-five trim ocean racing yachts of all sizes and rigs, white-hulled, black-hulled, mahogany-hulled, 
knifing through the long, gentle swells of the Catalina Channel, maneuvering with a skill that is born to blue water sailors. Aboard the Segway, with Vanessa Evans' slim, strong hands almost caressing the wheel, you know the excitement. Share it with every other sailor on every other boat. As the seconds tick away, and the navigator's voice continues the countdown. Eight. Stand by to get the fishermen up as we cross the line. Standing by. Five. Flash in the air. Three. Two. And one. Up on the hill. If I hadn't been looking, I would have thought your father was at the wheel. Thank you, Pete. Beautiful start, Vanessa. I don't think you had more than two seconds to spare. I thought for a minute we were going over the line too soon. I was scared, Mike, really scared. Oh, you handled her like a master. And we're doing great. Look, I don't think there's more than two boats ahead of us, maybe three. Well, that cutter isn't going to wait for us, though. She'll weather us all the way to the west end of Catalina. But once we get around, we can really put some sail on, see what she can do. Well, we're pointing higher than that catch over there, leaving her, too. The catch? Yeah, right over there to stop it. Oh, the yawl. No, she's a... Oh, oh, yes, of course, she's a yawl. Unless, of course, they've changed things around out here. Right? No, 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 she's a yawl. It's a, just sort of a mental block I have. Never can remember which is which. It's an easy enough mistake to make for a blue water sailor. Oh, come now, Mr. Farley. Look at Vanessa, and she's looking intently at the compass, avoiding your eyes. And you look at Hugh Guthrie, and he doesn't avoid your eyes. And you know that you made your first bad mistake. And he knows it, too. for three days, and so far you haven't made any more mistakes. But you know that Vanessa's cousin Hugh hasn't forgotten your slip. You know he's watching and waiting for you to make another one. And you're certain that next time he won't let it go. Not this boy. But there are moments aboard the Segway, rare but wonderful moments when you're alone with Vanessa out on the pulpit, a tiny fenced-in platform on the forward tip of the bowsprit, with nothing but the sound of the wind and the bow wave. She's beautiful from out here, isn't she, Mike? She's beautiful from anywhere, like her skipper. Mike, if I ask you something, will you get angry? Of course not, darling. I couldn't be angry with you. It's about you and... and Hugh. What about you and me? Well, I don't know what it is, Mike, but... but from the very first day of the race, you've been standing off watching each other. There's something between you. What is it, Mike? What's happened? Well, as a matter of fact, Vanessa, I felt it too. Mike, you don't like him, do you? Well, I don't dislike him. I don't think he likes you, Mike. He, he's been pumping me about you, about your parents, where you were raised, what boats you've sailed on. <laughs> well, I'm flattered by his interest, but... Why is he so concerned with me? Because he's my guardian, Mike. Your guardian? Why, he's only a couple of years older than you are. I told you he was one of my smarter type cousins. Daddy liked him, wanted it that way. So, uh, he controls your money? He controls everything Dad left for me. And your heart, Vanessa? I control that, Mike. Well, that why are we talking about things that don't matter? Who cares about your money? Let old cousin Hugh have it if he wants it. Who cares about anything but us, Vanessa? Us? That's all that matters. Mike. Look, I don't care what happens as long as we have each other. Oh, Mike, darling. Vanessa. Vanessa. <laughs> He 
stay out on the pulpit after Vanessa leaves, and you try to digest this new and unpleasant piece of news. So Cousin Hugh is Vanessa's guardian, her legal guardian. And you think of what a little thing loused up your plan. Just poor old Charlie's appendix. And you begin to hate Charlie, to wish he were dead. Or, wait a minute. Why Charlie? Why not Cousin Hugh? You and he share the midnight to 4 a.m. watch out here on the pulpit every morning. Sailors have gone overboard before. Out here at night, in the dark. A quick push. An accident. An unfortunate, terrible accident. It's the only way out. You know you have to do it. The only question is when. to marry Vanessa, and two, to get rid of her legal beaver cousin, Hugh. The first work until the second is finished. But everything's got to be just right. The wind must be high enough and the sea rough enough, the night black enough. And seven days out, midway between San Pedro and Honolulu, the right time comes. With the wind blowing 20 to 25 knots and the sea coming at you in long rolling swells, the tops blowing off, feathering into the night, the bow of the Segway seems like a giant bucking bronco, lifting high only to plunge back in, open and all, down into the black angry water. You and Hugh are wearing your flotation gear, small but efficient life jackets that inflate when you squeeze the handle of a CO2 bottle. But you know that Hugh will not stay afloat once he's over the side. You removed the little steel air bottle while Hugh was eating dinner. And in its place, you inserted an empty one. And one thing more. You fixed the lifeline fastener on the pulpit so it's ready to be opened at the right time to provide a convenient exit for Cousin Hugh. A broken fastener on the lifeline, they'll say. An accident. An unfortunate accident. So now you're out here on the pulpit with Hugh and you're ready. But before you do anything, you have to know how much he knows about you. You have to. It's almost a compulsion. I, uh, I had quite an interesting talk with Vanessa the other day. Is that so? Yes, we, uh, we talked about a lot of things. Mostly about you. Really? She, uh, she said she didn't think you liked me very much. I may have given her that impression... You said you've been asking a lot of personal questions about me. That's right, I did ask some questions. Why? Because I don't believe a word you say. Just because I made a few small mistakes, like calling a yawl a cat? Oh, the business of the yawl really had very little to do with it. There were so many other things. For instance? Well, for instance, you're sailing as a crew member on the Quintana in the Bermuda race of 1952. It was the year you sailed on it, wasn't it? That's correct. Well, despite the amazingly factual quality of your story, you were not on the Quintana in 1952. You can prove that, of course. Quite simply. You're a good student, Farley. You've obviously done a lot of reading on ocean racing. But you made a mistake in the Quintana story, and a rather bad mistake. You mentioned the names of the crew, but you left out the name of Hugh Guthrie. If you sailed the border, how come you left that one name out? Because you weren't on the Quintana. Correction. I seem to have a knack for being a last-minute replacement. On this race, it was poor old Charlie Edmonds. On the Bermuda race of 1952, it was a lad by the name of Kirby Meston. He was on the Quintana. It was printed, it was in, the... printed in the official crew list. Yes, but he was not aboard. He broke his leg on the very morning of the start. And I... Lucky Johnny on the spot happened to be there to see an old friend off who happened to be the skipper of the Quintana. I replaced Kirby Vesta. That's you impossible. See, Harley, you're a bit of a liar. And I don't trust liars. Particularly when they're moving in on someone very dear to me. Vanessa. Vanessa. Oh, yes. So now it's up. I thought you were awfully interested in your little cousin's future happiness. In fact, I warned Vanessa about you. You 
don't want me to marry her because you want her for yourself. All right, Polly, let's cut up the nonsense. You're a cheap pony, and I'm going to tell Vanessa the truth about you. I won't tell her anything because you're not going anywhere except over the side. I don't think so. You're going over now, right now. Oh, you're a phony, Mr. Polly. A phony. No! A no! As you lunge for him, a giant wave smashes over the pulpit, burying you in tons of water. You grab for the lifeline as you start over, but the fastener you doctor carries away, and you feel a sharp, tearing pain as a hook-like end of it rips through your hand. And then you're alone in the water, watching the Segway as she rushes on into the night. You inflate your life vest, and it works. And then you see, off in the distance, the spreader and deck lights come on, and you hear the voices, hurried, frantic, as they get the sails down and try to bring the Segway around. And you know your plan is finished. But you're alive. And that's all that matters now. You're alive. And they're coming back to pick you up. And then, there's something between you and the lights on the same way. A triangular blue-gray fin, cruising slowly, almost indifferently, slicing through the black water a scant ten feet away from you. And you suddenly remember the recent stories in all the newspapers of killer sharks and what they can do to a swimmer. And you lie very still. That's what they said to do. And you watch. And the fin cruises away. And you start to breathe again. And then it circles. Seems to flutter in the water. And pick up speed. And you raise your hand in a futile gesture to ward it off. And you suddenly know you're not going to make it. Your hand, sliced to the bone from the hook on the lifeline, is bleeding. And you remember that sharks are attracted to blood. It's the thing that makes them attack. And you open your mouth to cry out. And the cry never comes. Because you're pulled down through the blue-black water. And something has you in a vise of razor-sharp teeth. And then you do scream. With the last breath you have. And no one hears you. Or ever will. Sloan starred in William N. Robeson's production of Blood is Thicker, written by Sam Pierce. Supporting Mr. Everett Sloan in tonight's story were Kathy Lewis, Lawrence Dobkin, Bill Quinn, and Sam Pierce. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with Mr. John Lund, starring in Eyewitness, another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. 